Hello, and welcome to this news update edition of From Paper to People, the podcast. I'm your hostess with the mostest, Carolyn Neil Lachlan. My goodness, are we at episode 311 already? Wow. Welcome to anybody who may be new to the podcast. If you are, I hope that you will listen from episode one. This is just a quick note, a couple of things that are going on right now that I want you to know about. The first is, somehow, for some reason that I'm not quite clear on, a bunch of Twitter bots decided to attack my Twitter account. And as a result, I am temporarily suspended. So if you follow at Ancestors Alive on Twitter, you will see that it says that the account is temporarily suspended. You can still access the content, but I can't publish anything new to the account. And that's problematic. So Twitter's supposed to be calling me with a verification that's going to allow me back in at some point. And when I try to invoke that, I don't get the phone call. Very, very frustrating stuff. I have been tweeting at them every day from other accounts, and I still can't get an answer. So I've set up a new Twitter account, and I'm starting from scratch. I have 100 followers. I used to have 1,500. It's really kind of sad and scary <laughs> because I put in all that work, and now it seems to be at least temporarily gone. So if you want to follow me, still follow Ancestors Alive because that account may well become unlocked sometime within the next year or so if Twitter ever bothers to get back to me. In the meantime, I am now at FPPP Podcast. And that is how you can find me on Twitter right now. I'm slowly rebuilding. I'm doing everything that I can to get the word out. That's why I wanted you to know. That's number one. Number two, I have figured out what my project is for 2021. 2020 was supposed to be hashtag blog 2020, where I blogged about all of my enslaving ancestors and provided documentation about not only the fact that they enslaved other humans, but also when and if I can find it, the names of people they enslaved as found in wills and things like that. Unfortunately, COVID did a number on a lot of things, including on my genealogical work. And I am now serving as a Lexis researcher for the New York State Contact Tracing Initiative. First, I was a contact tracer calling people, hard work. But now I have switched over to a different workflow. It's actually not quite as hard on my body, and I'm excited about that. So I'm back to working on the podcast on a more regular basis, and I hope to be giving you better content. Blog 2020, maybe it'll come into some other kind of life in 2021, but the main thing I want to focus on in 2021 is this. In World War II, during World War II, there was something called the home front. My older listeners will know this. They will be familiar with it. Younger listeners may not be as familiar. The home front was a concept and a way of life that was imposed upon us by the war. This is certainly true in the United States. I know that it was true in the UK. It was true in Canada. It was true in Australia. In places where the war wasn't being fought with troops on the ground or places that were actively being bombed, everything changed. So if you weren't actually fighting the war on your property... You were fighting the war in a different way. It wasn't with guns and bombs and airplanes. It was with rationing and victory gardens to grow your own food. It was with recycling scrap metals in order to help enable the war effort to build armaments. It was women working in places they had never worked before, like shipyards. Women worked in factories. Work changed for women. Men went to war. Women handled the means of production and the production of bullets and airplanes and uniforms and all kinds of things that they hadn't really been involved in before in the economy. And I'm thinking right now specifically of the United States. But they were building ships and they were building airplanes and they were on the assembly lines that used to be 
worked by men and producing cars. And now they're producing tanks. It was an amazing change. People canned food in a way that they hadn't done for generations. People were involved in the war and the war effort in a non-military way. And life changed. There were rationing books and food was rationed. Certain kinds of products were reserved for the military and for the forces who were fighting in both the European and the Asian theaters. And as a result, the quality of life changed for Americans, for Canadians, for people in Australia. I want to talk to you about your family's involvement in the home front. What family stories do you have? What kinds of changes occurred in the way that your family ate because of rationing, because of victory gardens, because of deprivation of certain kinds of products not being available? Recipes came into my family during the war as a result of people having to cook primarily with canned foods, either foods that they purchased canned or foods that they preserved themselves. But things changed. The idea is that along with that, along with those privations that were specific to that time, that place, and that set of circumstances, was a sense of unity, was a sense of community, was the idea that people were working together toward a common cause. They were working together to beat Hitler, to beat Mussolini, to beat Hirohito, to beat fascism. And as they were working to beat fascism, they were willingly saying, I will do without butter. I will eat margarine from a bag instead. I have a margarine story that I'm going to end up telling, and that's part of it. (laughs) I will make these sacrifices in order to serve the war effort, in order to make sure that Hirohito and Hitler and Mussolini are beaten. Here's another thing. Some people actively participated in the black market. And in doing so, they got unfair shares of meat and dairy products, eggs, all kinds of things. And I'm wondering how many of you out there have stories from your parents, your grandparents, your great grandparents that involve how they did or did not participate in these events and in these privations and how they affected their lives. Why is this important to me right now? Because I see a parallel between being willing to eat foods you would not normally eat or grow food when you did not grow food or work in a place that you definitely would not have worked in and what we're dealing with now with the COVID-19 pandemic. Right now, we have to wear masks. Right now, we have to social distance. Right now, we have to sacrifice being with our friends and relatives Because to do so is to endanger public health. I say this as a contact tracer. I say this as a researcher for the New York State Initiative. It is not a political statement. It is a statement of fact. We have to do these things. And I don't understand fundamentally why it is that anybody would see it any other way. Because it's science and it's medicine and it's reality. Over 300,000 people have now died in the United States as a direct result of COVID-19. And some of them were my friends and family of my friends. And I take that seriously. I take it very, very seriously. I want to understand how it is that the time when people pulled together and that is storied, the time that is called the era of the greatest generation parallels with what it is that we are trying to do now. What did they have to fight against in terms of the black market that we are fighting against in terms of people who are anti-vaxxers and people who are COVID deniers and people who are anti-mask? The simplest thing in the world, wearing a piece of cloth over your face. I want to have these discussions and I want to have them throughout the year. And I want us together, as an international family, to consider these ideas and to think about what it is that we can learn from how our ancestors handled the war. How did they handle the home front? 
how did they handle the fact that they couldn't see their loved ones for long periods of time because some of them were serving in the military and they weren't necessarily receiving a whole lot of information about where those people were or how they were doing. Very scary stuff, a very frightening time. I really would like to talk with you about that. So if you have a story, any kind of a story at all, I want to hear it. I want to put it up on the podcast. There are two ways that you can do this. One is I can interview you. The other is you can record a story and you can submit it to me by mail. You can send it to fppp.podcast at gmail.com and I will be thrilled to include it in the stories that I am gathering now, either recorded or written in some cases, or the stories that I will be recording, starting with a recording that I'm doing tonight. Please consider participating in this because I love the idea of group participation. I had so much fun assembling that Skelly Rellies episode. Yes, it took me a year, but I did it. And now that I'm doing the work that I'm doing, I have a lot more time and energy for the podcast, and I want to be timely in what it is that I give to you as a product, as a thought piece, as something to listen to, as something that will maybe help to include you in a larger conversation. So think about that, won't you? And in the meantime, do your work. Don't be a Jeffrey. And remember, expect surprises.